After nearly eight months of back and forth with the federal government, this month, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press has once again argued that the secret warrants, which allowed myself and Project Veritas journalists to be raided, be unsealed. This is because raiding journalists is antithetical to the Constitution and a host of other American laws. When you issue a warrant against a member of the press, the government must unseal and release its probable cause for obtaining that warrant. Without doing that, the government has the power to rifle through journalists' confidential sources all under the guise of finding evidence of a crime. The U.S. attorneys in the government wrote this letter in June attempting to avoid releasing the contents of the affidavit showing the probable cause for the warrant. They claim that even though the government's investigation had been widely reported on, the government hasn't confirmed any details about the investigation. Then, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, first week of July, nailed the government on this point, pointing out the wide reporting by the press appears to be because the government, the Southern District of New York, is talking to the press as anonymous sources. The government argued there's a vast gulf between a news outlet reporting a particular fact and the government disclosing that fact. You go through all your anonymous sources to make sure, journalists, you're not breaking the law. That, of course, creates a constitutional crisis. This is wild. And we have a lot to get through. We're going to go through all of it. You won't want to miss it. As you all know by now, in November of 2021, the FBI raided my home and the homes of two other Project Veritas journalists. The raids prompted mass outrage with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, the ACLU, the Committee to Protect Journalists, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, and even mainstream media to question if the government violated the law in obtaining the search warrants to begin with. Josh Gerstein of Politico, he's the guy that published the leaked Roe vs. Wade document, wrote that, quote, FBI raid on Project Veritas founders' home sparks questions about press freedom. University of Minnesota law professor Jane Kirtley, who describes herself as not a big fan of Project Veritas, said the raids were just beyond belief and that she hopes the government gets a serious reprimand from the court because this is just wrong. Now, raiding the homes of journalists can only legally be done in rare circumstances. In fact, we're not aware of this ever happening before the FBI raiding uh, investigative reporters, CEO of a media company. And that can only happen after the government has complied with a whole host of things. The Privacy Protection Act, the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, the Attorney General Merrick Garland's own memo last year saying the DOJ does not raid journalists anymore. On November 19th, 2021, the U.S. attorneys, the prosecutors in the Southern District of New York actually wrote the following sentence in a motion opposing the appointment of a special master in our case. They wrote, quote, Project Veritas is not engaged in journalism within any traditional or accepted definition of that word. The government alleged our reporting consists almost entirely of publicized non-consensual, surreptitious recording, unquote. This prompted one Mike Cernovich to say, a federal prosecutor actually said this, <laughs> that we're not journalists because we don't get consent, permission, from the fraudsters that we videotape. That's an extraordinary statement by federal prosecutors. The very next page of that motion, the U.S. attorneys proceeded to quote all of these opposition research blogs about Project Veritas calling us non-journalists. Of course, those U.S. attorneys edited out all of the federal judges in all of the cases that we've won who have actually called us journalists. Now, after the prosecutors filed this motion, the U.S. District Judge Annalisa Torres ruled against them and appointed a special master and effectively called us journalists. In that order, federal judge Torres in New York cited our, quote, journalistic privileges, even the FBI considers us a news organization, so the judge ruled against them. So that pretty much closes the case because if you're considered journalist, if you're considered news media, you don't raid news media without unsealing the probable cause. And that gets us closer to where we are today. The fact that we don't get the consent of the people we record is a standard no other organization is held to. Now, as Josh Gerstein wrote, while many of O'Keefe's tactics are unsavory, they are far from unknown in the mainstream press. I mean, hidden camera stings and undercover reporting have fallen out of fashion at most traditional news organizations, but they were once a staple of network, television, news, magazines. 
What investigative reporter ever, ever gets permission from their subject to report on their misdeeds? I mean, did NBC4 reporter Joel Grover ask Jiffy Lube if it was all right to film them committing fraud? Prosecutors don't actually expect ABC, NBC, and CBS and all the rest to adhere to such a thing. That would be ludicrous. It defies common sense and universal definitions of what journalism ought to be. Now, you may not care when the raid happens at Project Veritas's door because you don't like us, but I'm sure you will when the government inevitably and invariably uses this exact same thing as a weapon against you. The only way to prevent it from happening again is to hold the government accountable. Just days after the raids, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press asked the SDNY to unseal the government's affidavit they used as a basis to raid my and other Veritas journalists' homes. Now, just a month after the raids, Magistrate Judge Sarah Cave, who signed the warrants against me, denied the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press request, keeping the affidavit secret. Now, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press appealed the denial to Federal District Court Judge Annalisa Torres, where it now sits on her desk. The government once again argued against both the RCFP and the ACLU's request to unseal the affidavits that led to the FBI raids. But what was the government's reasoning? This is when things get absurd, preposterous, crazy. Quote, indeed, despite the numerous briefs filed in this matter, neither the RCFP nor the ACLU have been able to identify any instance in which a federal court granted the extraordinary relief they seek. Well, that's because it never happened before. Of course there's no instance. You've never raided the New York Times. You've never raided CNN because that's not allowed under United States law. You broke the law so egregiously, and then you say, there's never been an instance where we've done this before. That's tautological. And you have the audacity to say that because your assault on freedom of the press has no precedent, that the RCFP and the ACLU can't, quote, identify any instance in which a federal court granted, unquote, unsealing in a case like this? Then in December, magistrate judge ruled and denied the unsealing of that affidavit, saying unsealing the affidavit would disclose to the subjects the full range of potential criminal violations being investigated. Disclosure of that information to the subjects or other participants in the alleged criminal activity whose identities are unknown creates the risk that they could conceal or destroy other evidence, influence information, and testimony given by others, and otherwise delay or obstruct the investigation. Now, the RCFP responded to that, rejected that argument, pointing out mere speculation about risks is not enough to justify keeping the government's misdeeds hidden from the public, and ignores that much of the information the government argues needs to remain hidden has already been publicly disclosed. Quote, when the government resists disclosure of search warrant materials, courts have generally required it to submit evidence and arguments specifically addressing the factual circumstances at hand. The government did not do so here. The order pays little heed to the wealth of information about the government's investigation already in the public domain. Now, on May 13th, the ACLU wrote a letter to federal judge Torres. Remember, there's a magistrate judge, Sarah Cave, and the federal judge, which this is being appealed to. The ACLU wrote a letter to her and felt compelled to join the fight. The ACLU even says, quote, even if Judge Cave's order were correct when it was issued, the light subsequently shed on the government's investigation may have diminished the need for continued secrecy with respect to substantial portions of the search warrant materials, making redaction more feasible than it might have appeared previously. So then the government responded. The requirement that a court make specific findings supporting sealing does not mean that the findings must be unique to that particular case. What the hell do you think specific means? As if that weren't bad enough, the government then responds to the Reporters Committee and ACLU's observation of the detailed reporting surrounding the government's investigation warrants unsealing by arrogantly saying, quote, there's a vast gulf between a news outlet reporting a particular fact and the government disclosing that fact. The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, in their own response to the denial, obliterated the government's argument with this. Much of the reporting on the government's investigation appears to be based in part on disclosures made by the government itself to members of the news media, noting reporting citing, quote, extensive interviews with people involved in or briefed on the investigation. Coincidentally, the New York Times recently admitted in a legal filing, that's in this 
Supreme Court of the State of New York Appellate Division, Second Division, in the Project Veritas versus New York Times defamation lawsuit. Its reporters, quote, received legal memoranda that had been drafted by a Project Veritas lawyer in the course of the Times news gathering regarding the current FBI investigation into Project Veritas. Hmm, how did they get that? The government can't say it must seal the affidavit to prevent anyone from knowing what it's investigating while it has disclosed everything it's investigating to the very media publishing these disclosures. Mike Schmidt and Adam Goldman of the New York Times. Remember these guys? Adam Goldman was mentioned by Rosenberg as the guy who doesn't write very well in one of our undercover investigations. No, Goldman. Right. Goldman's a terrible. No, he's a really good reporter, and editors do it on her writing form. He's a terrible writer. It's Mike Schmidt, the guy who says he's just some dude with a notepad recorded by one of our employees after Schmidt was trying to recruit one of our employees against Project Veritas. I'm just trying to figure out what happened with the stupid fucking diary. I got a pile of shit on a table, right? Mm. Of a bunch of shit that happened around this PP stuff, right? I'm just some dude out there with a fucking blank notepad in a crazy fucking world trying to figure out what the is going on. Moments after I was put in handcuffs, I got a text message from, yes, Mike Schmidt at the New York Times. Here's a copy of that text message. When you put investigative reporters in handcuffs and take 200,000 of their emails, throw them against a wall while they're barely wearing any clothes, and you inflict trauma and violence against the press, that means a lot more than whatever marginal concern you have for the embarrassment inflicted on the people that you put in that affidavit. So where was this concern from the government when the, quote, two people briefed on my raid leaked information to the New York Times the morning I was raided? Does it matter that the government's actions have stigmatized myself, my employees, my journalists and their families by sensationalized and out of context insinuations that damages freedom of the press in the United States, a country that places a primary value on the First Amendment and the public's right to know. That's the most important value in the United States of America. It's one of the reasons this country was founded. Does it not matter that unsealing the affidavit is likely to prove the government violated the law in raiding me and my journalists and would prove Project Veritas' is innocence? What are they hiding? Why are they afraid of this affidavit being unsealed? And just who are they protecting? Now, federal judge Torres must decide if the government can simultaneously disclose only their favorite details of their super secret investigation to the New York Times while simultaneously shielding their unconstitutional actions from the public's view. For federal judge Torres, to rule against Project Veritas and to rule against the press itself, as well as the ACLU and the Reporters Committee, would be the greatest authoritarian power grab by the government in United States history, full stop. And that is why we won't lose and we can't lose. And we're very grateful for the ACLU and the Reporters Committee to have our backs.